Hey everybody, welcome to Randomly Selected, powered by The Silver Room. My name is Mario. Thank you so much for checking us out, man. It's been a pretty cool year with some really great folks, and today is not anything less than great. We are with Asia Calcagno, and Asia is going to talk to us about how she got started with writing and what triggered that passion for her. We also talk about how authenticity is the primer for her writing platform. She's a CPS teacher, and we talk about transitioning to Oak Park when she was a little kid and how being a student from both locations, Chicago and Oak Park, how they shaped how she teaches now. It's Asia Calcagno on Randomly Selected. I don't share this story too often because I'm not always asked. I think that there is just an assumption um, about how I got started. But I remember being 14 years old and I was sitting in my English classroom and uh, I went to Oak Park River Forest High School okay. uh, for high school. And so we had a huge poetry scene uh, and poetry education program that was just really effective and really beautiful. And I was sitting in the you know, front row. Um, I also was new, newer to the, the Oak Park education scene because I went to CPS like m my entire childhood from first to eighth grade. So um, I didn't really know a lot of people. I was really alienated. And there was an educator, a teacher, who was in the poetry education department. And she was standing, you know, at the front of the classroom. And the classroom was loud, boisterous. Just everybody was kiki and just, just, just having a good time. And she just started performing a poem. Mm. She silenced the room by just starting to perform mm. and I've never seen anything like that a day in my life I've never I, I, that moment even thinking about it now just kind of wows me just the power of somebody who just walks into a space no one really notices them and mm. then they just silence the entire room and I said to myself just internally like that feels exactly like the thing that I want to be doing who was the teacher her name was Christina Santana. Nice. Yeah, okay. she she I don't know if she performs anymore, but um, yeah, she was someone really vital to me. Someone I considered a mentor throughout high school, among other educators. But yeah, that that moment has always kind of stuck with me because I was kind of floating. I was in a moment in my life where I was also 14. I never really knew what I was good at. Mm. Um, I knew that I had skills. I knew that I could look at a canvas and, you know, paint something I you know dabbled in sketching but I was more of a dabbler I never really was like this is the exact thing that I know that I'm good at and I want to continue and thrive in you you mentioned uh the Oak Park River Forest uh experience Respect the Mic is a great book I'm not saying it because Sully's my boy Dan <laughs> Sullivan yeah. Or my experiences Love, at Oak Park River Forest High School, but that's a great book. It's yeah. it's a really good primer for young folks who are in high school and yeah. in college to see how it's done. Everybody in it is extremely dope. It, it is it is a book that I flip through often just to get that thing back for myself. Yeah. Um, being a writer and all that, um, I I know that for me and for friends of mine, friends of mine that you know. <laughs> um, we often talk about in our in our writing. We often talk about authenticity mm. and making sure that we tell the story correctly, whatever mm. the story is. If it's a personal story, if it's a, a, a story of fantastical proportion and weight, just being authentic in whatever it is. Is is that a primer for you in, in terms of your writing work? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm big on. Don't tell the story for me. Don't speak for me. Let me have the platform. Um, I, I think that that's something that I'm even in the season in right now mm -hmm. in adulthood, you know, entering my 30s. I'm like, yeah, you knew a past version of me mm. <laughs> and mm. she's she gone. <laughs> she's she's very, very far away from here in this space. And so um, I do think that that has been something that drove me to feel confident in picking up a piece of paper. Um, I never really wanted to emulate a style. I never really, you know, they were absolutely writers that I love and, and ride hard for and 
have really helped be a compass for me. But I knew for me in that, you know, writing became, oh, I'm good at this. No one can tell me that I'm wrong. This is a space, the first space in my life that no one can tell me, do this a different way. Mm. Um, I had so much creative autonomy. And then when I started performing, I'm like, oh, same thing. Like, no one can tell me that I'm wrong here. And it was a space for me to kind of, I, I have always seen and felt that I'm multifaceted. I exist in so many different multitudes. And that has been a way I can perform this way. I can write this way. Um, I can collaborate with someone in this way. Um, I can publish this piece that you know, it's very different than something that I've published before. And to be able to have that that space and that I get to inform this, where I think a lot of different um, spaces tell you or inform who you need to be. And writing has been absolutely a space I get to clear up mm. what y'all think right. <laughs> about me. Right. Or, you know, even how I write and perform now is very different than three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And that's the beauty of any art form. You get to grow over time and different seasons of your life and identities get to inform that. You were a classroom teacher, or you still may be doing classroom teaching. Um, you had the experience that a lot of people don't have of being mm -hmm. in the Chicago public school program and then going out to the burbs. Oak Park, for those that don't know, Oak Park isn't really a suburb. It's like the it is. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's like the westy part of the west side, if you know what I mean. It's very nice. Oak Park is a very lovely community. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you had to, you had the opportunity to be. Mm -hmm. A student in both yeah. of those systems. How did that play in your teaching when you worked with, with young folks? Yeah, you know, it's wild. Um, I didn't plan on going to OPRF. Um, it just made the most sense. Uh, dislocation has been a really big part of my upbringing. Mm. And so I lived with, you know, my grandmother for a long time. And then it there was a season where, like, me and my brother were, like, back and forth between Garfield Park and in my parents' house and Garfield Park and my parents' house. It was, it's, I'm still even synthesizing how that's informed a lot of what home means to me. I mean, I, I recently got a piece published. Uh, it was about like the 10 different addresses that I've had, Whoa. like during a certain span of my life. And yeah. there are more different addresses that I've like, claimed um, or spaces that I've lived or existed in, but I'm like, where is it really home? So that, that was really interesting to me, but I think being, it's interesting uh, that you asked that question and I, that's the first thing that comes to mind because going to the same school from first to eighth grade, I think is a unique experience mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I had the same, the same people that I gravitated with. Every class picture was the same people in it. <laughs> like, um, and then kind of going to a completely new space um, where I literally knew no one. The first day of school was so traumatic for me. Mm. It was like, this is crazy. Like I knew my brother. And he didn't even like when I saw him in the, <laughs> and I saw him in the halls, he didn't want to say hey to me. And I'm like this, you know, when you kind of go from one space of knowing so many different people to not. But that's just the social part of it. Yeah. Um, I also um, I was in the gifted track. And so that I think I was highly aware of how differently I was treated. Mm. I was highly aware of how kids in my class got away with some of the stuff that other kids didn't. <laughs> um, I'm like, I peeped that. I peeped all of that. And I think how it informed um, just who I became as an educator. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm about effective modes of education. I'm about, you know, who you are and all of the behavior that kind of comes with who you are and how you move is stemmed from a place. I asked Asia, how does she slow her own breath down in order to talk to her students properly? Is there a way to craft a better curriculum? I mean, we're all kind of wondering how we can make our children better at what they do, right? And we asked if we could do that within our current schooling program, since most parents aren't really familiar with the stuff that's being taught. And is putting restorative justice a valuable tool for today's day and time? Making that part of the curriculum as well. Here's more with Asia. You know, I so I've been in so many different classrooms, both as a ninth grade English uh, language arts teacher, 
as a teaching artist, as a guest performer. So many, I've been in so many y'all's classrooms. I, when I was in uh, undergrad, I even taught at every school in New London, Connecticut. Mm. Every school. I've been, I'm, I know all y'all's babies. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. That's the thing about me. And, you know, I, I remember the first time that I, the first day of school teaching um, in high school, you know, I actually threw up before the kids came into class. I was so nervous. I was so nervous. But I'll tell you, and not many people know about that. And it's, it was the nerves of all of that perception. And I'm like, I, I want people to know my heart, but I also, I'm not going to go through and jump through hoops to explain that. The thing about young people is that there, you have to consider where they're coming from. When you have kids who have 10 minute commutes, an hour and a half commute, there's a lot that has gone on through their day and that morning before mm. they even step into your class. If it's first period versus seventh period, who yelled at them? Did they get in trouble? Did somebody mama come up to the school? All that. I have to consider that. But I, I tried very hard whenever, no matter what position I've been as an educator, to try to level the playing field. But perception is interesting because, yes, I have been tested, but I also understand you're doing that for your safety. Mm. You, mm. I, I have to prove. Never well, thought about it that way. I don't that even want to say prove, right? Um, young people cling to you when they know that you're a safer space. And I can't tell you I'm safe. I'm the, I'm the person that come to me. No, you have to, you have to claim me as that. Um, you know, I also present very differently. I was out, out of school that I, I couldn't show my tattoos. Kids knew I had tattoos because they everywhere. And it's just like, I'm trying my hardest to cover it up, but whatever. Um, and there have been some moments when I've had to, you know, even repair a lot of harm with young people. Like I have, like the, the, the thing is we grew up right with parents, around a black parents who never apologized to us. Mm. Say I'm going to be the person who's going to apologize to you. Yeah. And I was also the teacher that, you know, I, I never said or called kids bad. Um, that's just not language that I want to utilize. Um, you know, they need a lot more love or they need a different type of love. Yeah. Um, we do that with our friends. Like all of our friends, you don't hang out and do the same things with them. You have to position kids in the same way and that they need something different from me. Um, uh, I need to show up differently. Um, so yeah, it's been a wild ride, but like, I think it's, to me, it's, it's education has been a soothing space for me and a growth space for me. And that who I am even as an educator now is completely different than who I was back then. Um, I also had the privilege of being able not to just teach, um, a, you know, a English language arts, but I also taught after school programming. Um, you know, after school education is such a valuable and, and healing space too. And that like kids show up completely differently after school. They get excited about, you know, what you're able to offer, right? They get to spend more time with you. And I think that a lot of educators for completely valid reasons, um, they're burnt out and they can't show up the way that they think they, they might be showing up or how they did first, second, or third year of teaching. So, um, yeah, I have a lot of love and respect for educators, but also at the same time, you got to have love and respect for young people too. I want to, I want to you say a word. I want to expound on that a little bit. And, and I want to kind of turn it toward the curriculum that mm -hmm. we're teaching young people. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, and I want to try to articulate this so, so, you get where I'm coming from mm -hmm. without sounding like I'm being judgmental of the system, Do although I am being a little bit judgmental. I don't think the lay person, not even the parent of a, of a student, really knows what they're being taught. They see the homework mm. that comes home. They see the report card. Mm. They get a progress report from a teacher. If the student isn't doing well, they get a phone call. But I don't think they really understand the curriculum part. Mm. I've been championing... Um, the 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 transparency of what's being taught in the Chicago public school system and just all of them, not just the Chicago public school system here, particularly in the state of Illinois, letting people know what we're teaching our kids, because we're talking 10, 20 years out after they leave. What did they learn about? Mm. Are we still teaching them about stuff? solely mm -hmm. that happened in the 20th century mm -hmm. are we not thinking forward and what the future might look like what constructing a proper future looks like mm -hmm. and, and including that restorative justice piece we'll talk about in a little bit 
how how do we do that? How do we mm. how do we arrange the conversation toward the toward the system that gives the educators the the battery, so to speak, to perform their task? Is it about a full blown transparent? Here's what we're teaching them, mm. or is there a way that you think there can be better involvement to to be able to craft a proper curriculum? Yeah, that's such a big question. Um, it's from, not often I come up with yeah. big questions. <laughs> it's a big one to chew on. I, you know, the first thing that's coming to mind for me is access. I think that there's a lot of language that is used within schools and within um, education leadership that is it's it's not as accessible um, as it can be. Mm. A big question that I always have is if we're creating a thing, who are we involving in the thing? Are students involved in the thing? Yeah, <laughs> you know, who are we parents creating it for? involved yeah, in the yeah. thing? Um, and I, I, I think too, there's an assumption that maybe a lot of parents don't want to be involved, and they do. I was actually listening to a podcast, and I wish I, I knew the name of it. Um, but it was something that was coming up around how a parent really, really, really was excited about enrolling her child in charter schools. And mm-hmm. it was because she was like, you know, I really, I know this is a, a very disciplined place, but I need help at home. And it was interesting to me that a parent kind of took from, I'm going to enroll my child in an extremely disciplined charter school and, and it's to help me parent my child. And I think that sometimes parents and guardians too, like sometimes it's not always, you know, a mother or father, just parent or guardians, right, that utilize school spaces as do what you can as long as my, my kid is showing up. Right. I know that my parents absolutely never checked my homework they just assumed I was doing it and honestly I was until I wasn't (laughs) so right (laughs) I I did I did fine I was showing up ish but um it's a big question that I wish I was more qualified to tell you because I know that there are some moves that some schools are trying you know to integrate the arts more and you know trying to get ways to get kids to show up. I mean, there's look at the chron- chronic truancy rates. Yeah. Like look at look at all of this. The kids aren't showing up for a reason. As, right? They don't want to be there. They don't feel like there's a space for me. Um you know, they have other roles that they have to play in their home. It's we have to consider what's accessible. Um but also involving parents and guardians is is someone going to pay for their time to take off work? to be able to be a part of these conversations to develop curriculum. It's a big one. Our kids have watched in the last 10 years, some of the most heinous things that have ever happened on the planet earth to black people. Yeah. Put a major event that no one had ever seen in our lifetime, a pandemic on top of all of that. And then try to explain to these same young people, there is a place where we can change how justice is exacted. Mm. Is it a valuable tool, you think, to put restorative justice into the curriculum in this day and time, just so that these young people know what that what is out there? And mm. in turn, maybe that changes what's out there. Mm. You know, yes. And it exists in some facets already. I know there are young people, and I've worked with some of them, um, who at particular schools I'm, I'm trying to think of the schools one uh, out, out west um it'll come to me but there are students who are teaching peace circles they are teaching mm. and, and training young people how to lead peace circles mm. um and the valuable thing about that for me is i love that it's in the hands of young people to be able to do it um and they're able to train and they're you know becoming qualified uh, to be able to teach the masses um i consider to when we are placing spaces for restorative justice in in school spaces and educational spaces it's valuable because schools are traumatic we have to consider that we have to just own that schools are not always a safe space um and they harm 
they do a lot of harm and it's not always just, you know, what's being missed, right. In terms of, um, the opportunity to add something into a curriculum, there are educators, um, you know, who are harming, there are particular rules and expectations that are harmful and not, not inclusive. Um, I think a lot about, yes, restorative justice, peace circles, all of these things, um, but what does it look like? And, you know, in-school therapists also are completely drained. Mm -hmm. um, if your school has in-school therapist or a counselor, <laughs> and if students have the opportunity to see them and have a conversation, but also what do they look like? You know, mm. do they come from a similar background? Um, are we involving parents and guardians and conversations too? Uh, do they have the time and energy and capacity to show up? Um, I think that restorative justice can look so differently. Um, also, you know, art therapy and, and opportunities for students to get involved in after school programming. Sometimes like we, we can come up with a buffer before the restorative justice have to hap has to happen, before the conversation and the healing has to happen. Um, I think a lot about the onus doesn't have to be on young people, though, because I, when I first heard a few years ago um, and, and was learning a little bit more about students being able to lead peace circles, I was like, that's brilliant. But then a, 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 a few, you know, a year, a few months went by and I'm like, actually, that's great and brilliant. Yet, how we're, what are we putting on young people in terms of responsibility and our adults? And where are adults taking responsibility and how are they taking responsibility? Mm. Because um, I think a lot about one of the, the first few weeks of me teaching, or maybe this is when I was preparing to teach, I had a colleague who told me, don't smile too much. Mm. And I said, I'm sorry, but <laughs> mm. Mm. what? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, if you smile too much, the kids won't take you seriously. That's a weird flex. It was extremely weird. And I'm like, that is not a flex, right? Like yeah. that. And also, let's think about the gender dynamics of you telling me that, yeah, first off. Um, oh, watch out. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I said, yeah. okay. And it, it for me, that set such a tone. Um, I, I smiled to my students. Like, they took me seriously. I'm, I, I can smile. But, like, it was interesting for someone to kind of tell me that as, like, a warning. Yeah. And I'm like, how are you viewing young people? Yeah. And also, how... How are you positioning yourself? Do you never smile at your students? Do you never take a moment to greet them with warmth? Hmm. And I can only imagine what sort of harm or repair had to be done in that classroom. And so it's all interconnected. Like it's 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 very not a one off. Like, do we just have to add restorative justice into into schools? Yes, but before we get there. Like that should absolutely be a tool for healing, but you know, in what forms are we also bringing in? Let's kind of take away this policy because it's not as inclusive, right. or this is racist, or this is uh, ageist, or this is ableist. All of these things before we have to get to a space, right? And yes, our young people are also consuming things at a high rate on their way to school, coming back from school. Um, on the weekend at home, right? Yes, we have to consider all of this and we should create school spaces to be less rigid. We talked to Asia about what it was like when she was first published. That's a really good feeling if you don't know. First impressions, reactions, all that. We talked about the wonderful Bronzeville Winery and why she loves that place so much. It's her new hangout if you didn't know. And we have some closing thoughts as well with her. But before any of that, we talk about how the world of dating was changed using an aux cord. I know. Fellas, listen up on that aux cord conversation. It's randomly selected with Asia Calcagno. It's so funny. I remember that <laughs> night. Um, <laughs> something that is important to know about my husband. I'm not throwing him under the bus. This uh -oh. is true. He then was not the best planner. He has gotten so much better at it. Um, <laughs> well, I wonder why. He, because <laughs> <laughs> we we didn't really have a plan for the first day. He picked me. I was living in Rogers Park at the time, and he was living in Hyde Park. So we clearly had a long distance relationship. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he he picked me up. I remember he was. 
uh, I knew he was there because somebody on the street was blasting Childish Gambino. My and man. I knew, oh, this this man rolling up. So yeah. I went downstairs. The first thing he said to me was, damn, you live far. I said, hello to you too. <laughs> um, and I remember asking, so where are we going? He was like, well, we can go ice skating or we can go to this pop-up art thing or we can go here. I said, so you didn't plan the date. Nice. And I'm just like, all right, I'm just here for the ride, you know. And he was figuring out, kept giving me choice. And I'm someone like, I just want you to make the plan for me because <laughs> I am the person who's always making the plans and putting in labor. Oh, if you knew how many times I have heard this I, I bet. <laughs> but, yeah, at one point, you know, because we're just riding around, he's figuring out what he wants to do. Uh, he gave me the ox cord, and I remember playing Erica Badu. And I'm like, I'm going to show up as my true authentic self, right? Um, Erica's my girl. She got me through a lot of writing. She yes. got me through college. That's my girl. <laughs> I'm a ride for Erica. And I remember kind of, uh, you know, looking over to see, is this the sort of energy <laughs> that he rocks with musically? And I remember asking at one point, I was like, "Is my are my music choices like okay? And he kind of gave me a, it is all right. <laughs> nice. But, you know, here we are, um, you know. Giving each other the ox court. That's that what's man. up. Yeah. That I, I, you know, <laughs> I think that's brilliant. That yeah. is, a, man, give that woman the ox court and see what happens. Because had you played like, you know, Bad Brains or Death or Judas Priest or something, that changes the complexion of the day. You know, I tried to show, <laughs> I'm very eclectic with my music taste. I do remember playing Tribe Word, that night. okay. All right. And then, uh, All right. And then I think he, he was like, oh, okay. I, I, I felt like I was trying to prove to him. <laughs> like, I'm not just me. Eric Badu. I could be Tribe Crowd Quest. I could be hey, all this. <laughs> oh, why that tickles me so much. I think that is like, when I read that, I was like, that's it mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. there's nothing that in relationships that we don't do where trust isn't like from the very first yeah. time you see somebody it's like i'm gonna hand her mm -hmm. this cord because i trust that she's going to do something dope <laughs> and then you do something dope yeah. and you've been together ever since yeah nice yeah. shout out to him yeah shout out to him always he may have saved the way relationships work <laughs> bless his heart um I, I also want to. I, I would be remiss if I did not talk about your work solely as a as a, a mm. writer and a poet and published and all that stuff. Uh, Golden mm. Shovel Anthology is one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate enough to be in a breakbeat poets. Mm -hmm. I know what that what that's like. I know yes. it wasn't your first published book. That wasn't my first time. I remember the first time being published though, because I was doing the teaching artist thing, mm -hmm. and I was like, I have something to show these kids now yeah. i got something to show them mm. like you can do it you can do it and then when breakbeat poets came out and some of my students who were then grown up saw it they came at me like you did it you big time you been and i'm like no <laughs> gee i've been doing this this been is doing it this is right new. but that experience of being published it's hard to it's just like when you record a, a record and you hear it on the radio it's hard to explain to people but i'm gonna give you a chance to do what was that like when you first got published and you saw mm. your work how did you feel how what was the reaction man that is so funny i i have to think about when it was the first time i was published i think it was i was in high school hmm. and wow yeah i i you know grew up in yca programming i i know that there was um an opportunity i think from that yca when i was like a part of the saturday programs <laughs> or or something of that nature that the University of Chicago was doing a publication. Can't remember what name, what the name of the magazine was, but it was so funny. That was one of my first publications, and then I got an email saying, "Come pick up, <laughs> come pick up the magazine." And I told my mom, and I'm like, "Yeah, you know, we got to go pick up this magazine." And this is actually a funny story. <laughs> I I went to. I told my mom it was UIC. Okay. It was actually University of Chicago. So we went to UIC. <laughs> Oh, wow. Went to the complete, and I called the woman. I was like, I'm outside. And she was like, Where are you? And then I had to go all the way, all the way south. It was so funny. <laughs> but actually, getting the chance to like hold the actual um, 
magazine was really dope. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I didn't think a lot about it. I, I try at this point in my life to not make publishing feel, what's the word? Um, prestigious mm. because we all know, right? Like it, it was a big deal for me to get published in this university magazine when I was 15, 16 years old. Um, you know, now, you know, I've, have been published in so many different spaces online in print, um, you know, poetry magazine, anthologies, all of that. Um, every time she feels special and, you know, I I was formerly director of programs at an organization called 826 Chicago, mm -hmm. which is a writing and publishing mm -hmm. um, agency for young people. It's in Wicker Park. And Shout out 826 Chicago. 826, Absolutely. love them. Um, and, you know, we pushed out so many different publications each year. So um, I think I, I considered a lot about the prestige of publishing via working there and that every one of our programs results in a publication but we do have printed bound pro professionally bound books right. and you know students are writing the forward and choosing the the cover designer and, and choosing the forward writer and it's you know students are headshots bios and there are also some some publications that we consider Oh, it's a SoundCloud, mm. um, a song, or you know, where you know, cr making buttons with student, where all of it is publication, and I, I'm glad that I've considered and taken away like the the prestige for myself, and that I should always celebrate anything that I'm pushing out, right? Um, but yeah, my first time was was this, this little magazine. I wish I could remember it. And I think even that is like, oh, I've had better publications. And yeah, that, that's right. not true. Right, it's not right, true. Because right. that at that time, I was definitely excited. And I was showing everybody. And, and now it's, um, yeah, my relationship, I think, to publishing has changed so differently. And it's I'm, not that it's yeah. passe. It's just yeah. that it's part of your gig. So, exactly. you know, yeah, because yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't. Pub, I don't get published <laughs> as much as I think I should. And I, I, unbeknownst to most folks, I submit all the time. It's just some, mm. some of my work is not for some people, which is fine. I That's think, true. I think I came to that conclusion and I felt better about being a writer that yes. I know what I write is way different than what mm -hmm. Tyampa Jess, shout out to Jesse, what yes. he writes. <laughs> I had the chance to sit across from him right after he won that Pulitzer Prize. Mm. And it was the most surreal thing ever because me and him used to hang out when he wrote when niggas love revolution like they love the bulls yeah. and that was in the, that was 92 93 mm. maybe and to see that kind of growth because olio is the shit i don't care what anybody is. says but reading yeah. that book that's the whole radio analogy it's like wow mm -hmm. when somebody reads my work and they can tell i read something you wrote mm -hmm. it's for me the equivalent of i heard your song on the yes. radio I, and I want to one more time on a teaching experience. I remember when I was assigned to go to Yolo Kali mm -hmm. and I hadn't been in an environment with Latino students before. Mm. And I remember feeling, I remember feeling confident. My, my uncle through marriage was from Venezuela, spoke six seconds of English, talked to me in Spanish, didn't know what the hell he was talking about ever, but I understood what he was talking about, if you know what I mean. So I wasn't worried about that. I was more worried about the perception of this black man because I wasn't really as well versed about Afro Latinos mm -hmm. as I should have been considering my uncle was Afro Latino. You know what I mean? And going into that environment in that neighborhood, right when Pilsen was getting all the gentrification juice was starting to flow all out of it. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, Oh, this isn't cool. I can see the change. This was like before Giordano's was down there. That's where Yolo Kali was. And, MFAM, Mexican Fine Arts Museum, and all that stuff. MFACM, I'm sorry. Um, but that perception of being in a classroom and the different kids and all that stuff, it was a it was an isolated feeling. Mm. Have you ever been in that environment where you were like, uh oh, <laughs> I don't know mm. if my if, my, if I'm gonna be able to work my magic in here with these kids? But mm. it turns out that that by virtue of us showing up. That's magic in itself, I think. Mm. How, did, how was it, or rather, did you ever have any of those kinds of experiences? Yeah, you know, the first thing that's coming to mind is is me on the other, san other side of the spectrum as a student. Mm. Um, I graduated with my MFA a few years ago, and, you know, I always thought 
because I grew up right in this city, like writing alongside so many amazing people that I now consider colleagues, not mm -hmm. my teachers and mentors anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, <laughs> right. A lot of them had MFAs or, you know, they took their writing so seriously. And I think that I've always been juggling so many things at one time. I'm writing and I'm an educator. I'm writing and I work here. I'm writing and I'm doing this. And I decided to get my MFA. And, you know, I didn't have the privilege to quit my job. I had to do a different type of program and I did a low res. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I won't, you know, name the school and it's, I think it was more so my experience and all of the identities that I held, right? And that uh, I'm a woman of color. I was also one of the youngest people there. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, you know, a, a, a rich spouse who was funding this right. <laughs> program for me. Right. Um, you know, my, my schooling experience was different. Um, so I think that it was it was really difficult in going there for 10, 10 days at a time, twice a year to do these writing residencies and, and work closely with these professors, you know, when we're remote. Right. Um, I think the experience that I had was a lot of imposter syndrome, but there were also moments that some folks have said to me. Right. Because I always thought my trajectory was I'm going to become a professor. And I remember sitting down when I was at one of the, the residencies and one of my colleagues or former students rather uh, said to me, because she was a professor, I said, hey, I just want to like hear your experience. And she told me, well, it won't be hard for you because, you know, a lot of universities want black writers anyway. It shouldn't be hard it'll be easy for you. And I hated that she assumed that something that would be easy for me. Mm. And I'm like, you don't know me. Mm. You don't know how hard I fought. Yeah. You don't, you know, don't, you know, don't know my story. You don't know my story. Yeah. Everything has been hard. Yeah. Every damn thing that I have and can claim as an accomplishment has been hard. Mm. And me, me asking, you know, just for that advice and that mentorship and, hold space for me and that this is something that I want. And that was very early on. And I'm like, oh, this place here isn't going to hold me in the ways that I thought it would. And yeah, I'm like, you know, it, it, I'm a first generation college student. I'm the first person in my family to get a master's degree. I'm the first person to do a lot of shit. And yeah. I'm like, you gonna tell me something's gonna be easy? <laughs> All right. So, but yeah, I think that 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 experience just because also I'm I'm always a position positioning myself as I have more to learn. And me getting the MFA was you know I want to take this writing seriously. I want to be in different spaces that an MFA will make things easier for me, but yeah. not easy. Yeah. Easier. It's it's gonna help me access. get some leverage. It's access. Yeah. And there's privilege behind that. But I'm like, nobody talked like me, walked like me, looked like me. Yeah. And I got friends that got taught by Gwendolyn Brooks at Chicago State. Mm -hmm. And they all say the same thing. They like it's got man, look, we got taught. She taught us. Mm -hmm. We earned that MFA. Yeah. MFA programs, if you can get in one, uh, young folks and older people like me, ha, do it because it's worth it. Um, I, I have been struggling with something about you for a while. Even when, when Eric was like, I would like, shout out to Eric Williams. I don't do that enough. Shout out to Eric Williams. That <laughs> he's going to be like, why y'all doing this to me? Um, <laughs> and I was struggling with how I knew you. Mm -hmm. And I had the poetry thing in my head, but I was like, that's not it. You were in a commercial. A car commercial? I was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you were in Okay, it was you then. All right. I did not pick any of that up in the research. I just remember it was like a commercial. I kept seeing that woman. Who is that? Mm -hmm. I know her face. And then I would see you at places. Yeah. Like that. Mm, where do I know her from? You also do stuff or you're around stuff at Brownsville Winery. Mm -hmm. Um what what is well, how do you feel about that? What is what you because I hear you're there a lot. Yeah, I'm I'm there a, a lot. Birdie has told me. <laughs> I am I sound there like a Michael lot. Sneed, right? Like in Sneed's <laughs> column today, we found Asia at Brownsville Winery. It's so embarrassing how much <laughs> I'm there. 
So I'm one of those people, I'm like, if I like a place, I'm just going to always go, you know, I'm, I'm very predictable in that sense. And that like, I have this, I order the same thing at places. I sit in the same chair. I, it's, it's, I'm That's just that funny. person. Um, I love Brunswick Winery. It's this it's, isn't a commercial for the winery. No, this is not a at commercial. Because I, I I have a follow up, but yeah, go on. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's right around the corner from me. There it is. <laughs> so there we go. I'm like, I can walk here. There you we know, go. I so I also don't drive. That's a really big part of my identity, and that I don't drive, which is funny. And that I was in a car commercial. I <laughs> yes. <cannot drive. laughs> that is crazy. Yeah. And I, uh, and I used to, I mean, all the time. I'm like, I know her face. You did a social campaign, a photo shoot or something there recently? At uh, the yeah, I did. I did. Well, so, okay. Poet, teacher, <laughs> uh, educator, MFA, uh, published writer, uh, actress, actress, I don't model, say that I'm an actress or a model. Cord I, I, ox cord worker? worker, <laughs> yes. I'm going to add that to my bio. Cord DJ. Cord, cord exactly. DJ. Um, I like that. I like that much better. No, I, it, it just came about, Erica's like, oh, since you always here, you and your husband free. Um, it was fun. That's how I got my fun. job with Eric. Well, since you're always hanging around me, why don't you do this? Huh? <laughs> since you, <laughs> take this microphone. Since you're so consistent. <laughs> since you're always here. Yeah. I mean, everybody, I think, at Silver Room and, and everywhere has that experience. Um, I, I've got to say, I wish that I had more time to chat with you. Uh, I hope we get the chance to chat over some wine one of these days soon. I can't wait to sit and ask your husband, brother, you did the most manly thing ever. <laughs> and uh, I really hope that everybody appreciates all that you've done and your contributions to, to this planet, man. It, it's vast and it's a lot and it's dope. I and thank you that. so much for being on Randomly Selected. Thank you for you're, having me. You're very welcome. As, you know, not often we get to talk to the smarts. <laughs> That's not true. We talk to the smarts all it's the a time. a lot of smart people who've been on here. The smarty eye. Thank you again. Thank you. Right on. We want to thank Asia Calcagno so much for being on our show today and for being part of the Randomly Selected family. As the year comes to an end, expect more great guests and conversation and all of that here on the show. And again, please remind yourself to tell people to subscribe to Randomly Selected powered by the silver room thank you to eric williams thank you to stefan thank you angie thank you to the whole team at silver room we'll see you guys soon peace